Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. Do you know, 50 years ago today, I just found this out, Slaughter on 10th Avenue came out. Now, I don't know what that means to you, Mick Ronson's solo album. No, I remember Mick Ronson's solo album, and it was a very, I remember it being a very big deal, it, it being made to look like a very big deal at the time, but it didn't quite land, did it? No, it didn't quite land, but I, I loved it, and it, it was a big influence on me, I think, as a guitar player. I, I particularly loved Slaughter on 10th Avenue, the sound really? of his guitar. Really? Because it's complicated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the sound of his guitar, I just thought, was so exquisite, so vocal. And, and I just wanted to mention, because I, I had that most amazing experience, you know, because he was one of the big influences in my life as a guitar well, player, yes, yes. Um, that I went and found that guitar, you know, That's years right. later. In, in Monte Carlo, wasn't it? I did a documentary, and I think it was for Sky Arts, and it was about Mick Ronson, and part of the journey, as you say on TV, it was to go and find this guitar. And it's a bit of a disappointment when you see it, to be honest now, because I remember that guitar looking so sort of strange. It was a blonde front, but it was basically raw wood at the front. It was a it was a Les Paul custom black that had it been... stripped it, hadn't Stripped it. Yeah. it. And then it had all got smashed up. But, you know, at one point, he dropped it uh, uh, when he was playing with Ian the Hunter, broke the neck off. It was all strapped. And it ended up in the back of Midjewer's wardrobe. What? Yes. <laughs> it ended up in the back of Midjewer's wardrobe. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis kind of vibe, you know. Go to yeah. the back of the wardrobe. <laughs> it's Mick Ronson's guitar. It was, yeah, Narnia and Mick Ronson's yeah. guitar. <laughs> anyway, it, Mick did it up in the end. and it. So when you see it now, it's all a bit lacquered and a bit, you know, it's not all what right. you wanted. I digress because you, there was a... Do you? There was a, I mean, do you? Wow. Because... <laughs> I, I, I just try... try yeah, I know, it's quite, offering this, up this news. Is, this is what we're all about. Yeah, it's what we're I digress about. because I think the second electric guitar I ever bought was an Ibanez copy of a Gibson 175. Why would? Uh, why did I buy that? Because our guest today is synonymous with the ES-175, which is traditionally a jazz guitar. Yeah, yeah. And it's all, also a Gibson, but I couldn't afford a Gibson. I got an Ibanez copy, a Not blonde one. Not case. <laughs> nice. And uh, for those who know, they know. And, um, yes. you know, he was a... Uh, listen, I don't know how he could be an inspiration because to play the kind of licks that Steve Howe played on that opening, the Yes album, you know, I mean, it, yeah. it's just, it's jazz, you're right. It, and it's phenomenal playing. But there was something inspired, it was something to achieve. I'm still hoping to achieve it. What I'm really amazed at with Steve Howe is just what was happening before Yes, because he was everywhere for a few years. It's amazing. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to getting yeah. stuck into that yeah. stuff. But also, yeah, it's, because what's incredible with Steve is, because he's the one person you wouldn't think of to associate with kind of post-punk or punk or anything. And yet he was Keith Levine. And apparently this was all the way back in the time of Pill and everything, always cited Steve Howe as his greatest influence. Well, see, there you are. And of course, the ES-175 was famously played by Geordie from Killing Joke. Trevor Horn was a massive fan. And Steve, who's coming on any second, you can just, just wait, just wait, played the acoustic guitar solo on uh, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. That's right. Did you know that? But of course, also, the best three Yes albums ever made, you know, the, the classic ones, the Yes album, Fragile, Close to the Edge, and more and yeah. more. If you try and go through the Yes sort of discography, topography, or, or tales of topography, even, <laughs> uh, and just all the people come and go, it's like your, your head explodes. Impossible. It, it's it's like, some, like sort of the, sort of some Austro-Hungarian royal family yes yes and even <laughs> even pete frame couldn't have put this rock family tree together without no, no, like pete frame that could have had an entire career yeah. just this, doing yes this wouldn't be a book would it it would be wallpaper if, if, if pete frame had to do yes <laughs> exactly good one end of verse side to the other <laughs> anyway let's let's get him on welcome to the rock on tours Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. That caused a big problem in the band, actually. 
I was having too much fun. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at yeah. something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Yay! And beautiful clarity. Your Wi-Fi is obviously pumped up, it, full it, of steroids. Listen, Starlink is is the only link you need because this is running at 120 to 300 megabytes. That's what I got. Oh, you got it too. That's what I got. It's oh, yeah. It's um, yeah. Well, I had no choice. But it's, I have um, no choice. <laughs> But it is amazing. U2 and Zelensky has it as well, doesn't he? I mean, That's it? right. It's what they use in Ukraine on the battlefield. Oh, God. We're not, and can I just add, we're making no money from Starlink right now, are we? Even though we're saying this. This is an ad. Steve, so lovely to finally get to talk to you. This is, yeah, this is brilliant. So great to have you. Sorry, and hello. I'm Guy. Oh, hi, Guy. How are you doing? I'm Gary. <laughs> and Gary, how are you doing? You've got the headphones on. Oh, no, you've both got headphones on. Sorry. I was, I was just saying that... Yeah. We were talking about guitar influences when we when we when, on our intro yeah. when we were kids, and you know, for me, uh, Mick Ronson was my first love. Oh, yeah. But then, after a, 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 a year or so, I bought an Ibanez copy of a one seven five because of you. Oh yeah, I could never play it like you. But I also want to add one other little thing there, where where your influence entered my group, Spandau Ballet, all those years later. Really? But when I was sort of looking for fellow musicians in about 1975 to form a band with, 76, the reason I hooked on a guy called Steve Norman is because I walked into the music room and he was attempting to play the clap. Oh, yeah. He was. Or clap, as I should say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but he did a pretty good job. Oh. And I thought, well, I'll hang with him. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, you can play clap. You must be okay, I guess, was a criteria. I think, yeah, we had that in the really early days. I mean, the, the very, very early days, if you could play Apache, you got the gig. You know what I mean? If you knew how to play that. But well, that was always a thing around, yes, wasn't it? From the beginning, I remember, because I remember Bill Bruford saying there was this terrible competitiveness about playing. And there was this worry that if there was anyone sort of down the street who could play a bit better than you, then you'd be out. Yeah, there was a sort of almost orchestral rule as well. Oh, that guy's you know the second base is screwing up change him <laughs> like kind of ruthless <laughs> but i mean yeah in a band like like yes it, 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 there, there was a kind of flow of musicians you know a lot of them were keyboard players but there was a lot of flow of musicians coming in and out and some of it was really unfortunate and we just had to deal with the what we were presented with you know here's the situation get on with it but uh you know other times it was it, it, it's like when jeff and trevor joined us for drama that was a kind of whole reinvention again of, of 70s yes uh and so there were lots of pluses anyway well you've been in you've been in yes the longest now now that uh, you know alan our rest in peace has, has gone and um you you are the longest member but do you think just saying that that it, it your particular sound and your style and who you are then mm -hmm. is is the hinge for it all that that and regardless of how many musicians are coming in and going mm -hmm. it's about you now steve really in well that sense. to some extent listen I, I noticed something i'd written i think i must have been looking at a scrapbook or a quote book or something but i i know i said when i joined yes that, that peter banks was a was a, a good guitarist and, and i had somewhere to take it from you know what i mean i had a starting point and uh, somebody once accused me of copying him. And I said, look, I was already like psychedelic out, you know, I was into my thing, you know, and I was looking for a band where I was as free as a bird, you know, I didn't want restrictions. And so, yes, was offered me that whole, whole kind of palette. But certainly my sound has become, you know, somewhat synonymous with it. You know, Trevor Rabin did the, did the 80s. And basically, you know, there was a... A shift back to to a more you know uh, uh, 70s desire for the sound and of course you know that music stood up incredibly well but we love making new music but you know it's also great to be able to play you know and pick and choose what we play from the great because as soon as you came into the band on yours is no disgrace and we'll, we'll go back to the beginning and we'll come back to yes i'm sure but just say no. you are all over that intro playing possibly every style of guitar <laughs> that you can you you had in your locker 
Yeah, I guess I did throw everything into yes, you know, because you know, I had nowhere else to put it really, and I'd been hoping that a band of equal uh, musicianship capabilities as me could could do something. And yeah, I had I had a lot of tunes up my sleeve, you know, I already had parts of Close to the Edge written, Tales from Topographic Oceans. Some of that wow. was, you know, in the 69 period when I was using one band and looking for the next band. You know, I, I wrote quite a lot of music and some of it became, you know, part of Yes. So, yeah, the guitar, the guitar, the way I was different from a lot of guys, I guess, was I wasn't really into a big trebly thing. I like warm sounds and I didn't, I like clean sounds, you know, and this was kind of like... But I had to marry it or mix it, if you like, with power. And yours, you know, just grace is a great example. Yeah, I'm all over the intro and the theme starts up and then I'm over the theme and then the vocals start up and then I get in. And when I do that solo with the touch of wah and, and that's a multi-mood solo, you know, it starts with a stabs and all that dead it there and clicking on the guitar and things quite rock and roll but once it starts moving it, it goes to different places you know and i remember bill saying to me after i'd done that solo i wish i'd known all the things you're going to play because i might have played something else but basically i designed that stu- that solo after the backing track was written so that you know i had those structures the do 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 and all that stuff i had all that kind of like just looking for a home, you know, and suddenly, yes, was the home yeah. so much of my guitar work, like it was with Worm and, you know, seeing all good people, you know, it was a lovely opening. I, I'll never thank the guys enough. Because, <laughs> of course, because when you come into, yes, Steve, all the stuff you're doing before, because this is what I'm going to do, you, you've got that period, that's, it's like three years before, yes, where you're everywhere. Mm-hmm. You are everywhere. It's fantastic. Um, um, lots of stuff. But then... Um, I said, but your sound, even before, yes, you were kind of very much ahead of the pack. A lot of people were still, like you said, trebly and twangy and everything. It's like you and Jeff Beck were kind of just that bit in front of everyone else. I think it was the influences, you know, the, the, I mean, although I like, you know, Hank Marvin, Dwayne Eddy, all the original guys, I got into Tal Farlow and, and Wes Montgomery big time because I saw him. And basically the styles I picked up, but then I heard Chet Atkins and that was it. It was like, ding. But I want to tell you a little story because although Chet has always been the guy I've always said. Shit Hopkins, as David Gilmore always <laughs> called him. Does he really? Hopkins? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, Shit Hopkins. Hopkins. Yeah. But you see, the, the really nifty thing was it took me years to realize in fact les paul had been a much greater influence on me because that started when i was about eight years old when my parents had the 78s and they were buying like you know he, you know the high how high the moon and the world is waiting for the sunrise mm-hmm. and, and and i heard all this guitar i didn't i just absorbed it you know so when i look back later i realized that yeah in les paul you know i met him a few times he's a character he was a character and basically, he was a huge influence before I even got to Chet. But once I heard Chet, yeah, I mean, I love this guy, you know, and, and, I, and I adopted that style. Like you say, on the Yes album, I'm playing Clap, I'm playing Yours and Yours Grace, I'm playing Worm. You know, there's a lot of variety. And that, that's what I think I learned from both of those guys. You know, your voice is, is quite comforting for me because that accent, I recognise so much from North London because <laughs> I, I, was, I was born and brought up on the Essex Road. Right. Uh, 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 not that far from the Holloway Road where you where you grew up, and Rod Stewart was also from there. Was he really? I didn't know that. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, his parents had a tobacconist just off the of, off of the Holloway Road. Oh, really? Oh, I must yeah, have, yeah. I might have gone in there when I was underage. But we were all like, "Nag, did you know the Nag's Head then? Because that was like a place yeah. in Holloway that was like the centre point. I'll meet you at Nag's Head. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, the Nag's Head is yeah very famous. But but. I just, you know, growing up then in that in that Islington world, we, we, we you, there seems to be elements of all, all this music coming into your life. Was this all through your parents? Well, those initial things were, and, and I found that any kind of music got me physically jumping around. Was he musical, your dad? He, he did like music, yeah, and he did his painting. He was, he was a, a master chef. He was a, a cordon bleu chef. And basically, he he had uh, some artistic skills, and uh, he did like music. And basically, the, the, you know, more like band music, and not not strictly jazz or anything. But as I had an older brother who liked jazz, and then uh, uh, my other young, young brother that was not as old but still older than me, he was really big on jazz. So I had those influences floating around. 
uh, all the time. I, I couldn't really avoid them. Um, but uh, Islington, the the, the 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 strange thing is that it's couldn't really find what I wanted in it and had to go to Tottenham. So part of my upbringing was, was as soon as I learned to play the guitar and I was looking for somewhere to play, I met a guy in Tottenham. That's funny because you're kind of moving further out. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, usually with London, you see me go further yeah. out. Of course, when it, a bit <laughs> later on, it became the epicentre with, with, with pubs like the Hope and Anchor, of course, which right. weren't, I don't think existed yes. in the 60s. When, yeah. So what, what, what was that, that, well, first of all, did you have a guitar by the time it, you moved to Tottenham, as it were? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I, I'm thinking that, well, I got a guitar when I was 12, you know, after wanting one for a couple of years, and it was a cello guitar. I picked it out myself. It was a cello guitar. I wasn't going to get a Spanish guitar or an electric guitar. I had to get a cello guitar. That was, that was my first guitar, was actually. Ch yeah, yeah, yeah terror. Could, could hardly press the strings down. They were so high. I know. Um, I, was, I was vaguely interested in dance band guitar because I bought a book called Eric Kershaw's Dance Band Chords, and that was that nobody was playing these chords. I thought, I don't hear these chords. But then, of course, they were in jazz a lot. And I wanted to learn a bit more about the so it wasn't Bert Whedon. You weren't Bert Whedon. <laughs> well, he was never very impressive because he was always too straight. You know, he was always a bit on. But I, you know, this story is, you know, I mean, he was the only guitarist I knew. His merchandising was homemade marmalade. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Eating a day. So, yeah, he was not, he was more mums and dads. You know, he was the middle of the road guitarist, you know. But yeah. so one of the reasons I got a 175 was because, well, Wes Montgomery was seen with one <laughs> and, and Jim Hall and lots of jazz guitar. Yeah, Joe pa did Joe Pass play? Joe Pass one? played a 175. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. Well spotted. And also uh, an English guitarist called Judd Proctor. Uh, uh, he played a 175. Now, he made a fascinating instrumental called Nola, which was very fast. You know, and I had to learn this, you know, by slowing it down to 33, of course. And and so the 175, um, well, that came later when I was 16. So when I was 12, I got the cello. But then I, with, within two years, I had an electric guitar. It was a, a Gaia tone. Uh, I think it's called LG50 or something, or sometimes called Nantoria. A little Japanese guitar, very small body with kind of big pickups. In fact, Hank Marvin was playing one of these before he got the strap, you know, with the intro ah, story that ah, it was written yeah, Bruce yeah, Welch. Yeah, 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 Hank's yeah. been on the show, Bruce Welch has we've been had, on the yeah, show. We've had them both on, yeah, we've right. had both sides. So that little guitar was great fun. I got a Burns jazz for a little while, which was... Too which the Shadows played as well, right, Burns? Yeah, with the Shadows. But of course, yeah. the Shads were quite synonymous with the with the Fender sound. I, yeah. I, I couldn't really grapple with Fenders at the time. But I, I, I was moving along. And then when I was 17, I said to my mum and dad, you know, if, if I'm going to do this for real, like, I need a great guitar. You know, I really need a good guitar. So when I said it was 200 guineas, they were like, what? I said, well, like, if you put the deposit down, you know, I'll pay the, I'll pay the, um, the regular monthly. God, in those yeah. days, that's a wow. two, 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 200 guineas. Two hundred quid. I mean, guineas. they were expensive. Uh, it's a house. And, and I had to, <laughs> I had to order it. <laughs> it came in two months later. So I got that guitar. That seemed to be like it, you know, with me. That I, I, it was like I've come home. This is the guitar, you know. And it turned out to be right that even though I switched endlessly across different Gibson guitars, every album during the seventies, eventually going somewhere in the middle to Fender Telecasters. And basically, I wanted to explore what the guitar could do, looking for a sound, but I kind of had it. <laughs> I already had it. I was looking around and looking around. But wherever I went, I seemed to make some sort of recognisable sound, even on acoustic. And that was a great, great breakthrough for me with Roundabout, was that I thought at the beginning, wait, is anybody going to know that's me playing? And, but, you know, in a way, the acoustic became a big part of my, my approach to music. Definitely. Oh, that harmonic riff. I worked that out. Yeah. So, <laughs> that was early doors. That was such a brilliant opening. Good. But you, 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 what you've not mentioned mm. is sort of what we normally hear from people on this show is the Beatles. Yeah. And, but that was still important to oh, you. Yeah. I mean, you were never after the dirty rock sound of Pete Townsend or... Not really. I, I realised that that was quite electrifying, you know, quite electric, you know, in its, in its qualities. But, uh, you know, there was certainly, uh, when the Beatles came around, that was that was kind of it for a while. They were the biggest thing in my life until Bob Dylan, you know, until I got freewheeling. So, you know, the Beatles kicked it, kicked it into gear. And, and I've got just total 100% respect for everything they did. I mean, that that's, that's the best band ever that, 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 yeah. that's been around. And, 
I can't, you know, there's no time when they're not somewhere near me or have some part of what I do. And uh, I love I love all that dearly. To jump ahead slightly, did, weren't you recording in Abbey Road when they were doing Sergeant Peppers at the same time? That's right. Tomorrow we're in there. Um, I did a reissue of of the Tomorrow album. It's now called... Oh, yeah, I tried to find that, by the way, because I could only find the 1999 remaster. No, don't buy that, please. This is a different no. world. I did a kind of Great revolver cover. on that where I took it. Didn't want to alter it too much, but I, I could see where we could improve things. And also the running order and the, some of the tracks went out and some others came in. So basically the, the sound that they made were on all those records and was just so amazing that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really, you know, but gradually, a second year, I mean, listen, 67 was the big year, you know, when Sergeant Pepper and Psychedelia and, and the Birds, for instance, that was another crucial band with me and Keith West. I mean, we just used to listen to how the Birds did things and go, oh, we want to do it like that, you know. So that's why we did their song Why uh, on, on, on our record. But basically... There was so much to absorb. You know, the Beatles kicked off a whole kind of phenomenon. And the Big Three were another band I liked. You know, Brian Griffiths was a great guitarist, you know, like like Mick Green in The Pirates. So there was this kind of breed of great guitarists who, it's a kind of history, you know, from singers. Singers usually, I mean, in a band like, you know, Led Zeppelin, you know, the singer and the guitarist, if they get on and they write music or they play well together, it goes on. But that's been going on for years, you know, since Rick Nelson got, you know, James Burton, since Elvis Presley had Scotty Moore. There's a whole yeah, thread Mick and Keith. of stories of singers with guitarists. And that's where I always dreamed I would be. I'd be standing there like this and there was a singer. You know, that was my kind of fantasy of, right, uh, right. of where I was heading as, as a young musician. Your first calling card, I mean, because you was like the generation before, you worked with Joe Meek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised yeah. you're not called Steve... Gorgeous or something, or <laughs> Steve X. <Yeah. laughs> you know, I guess he, he renamed all his artists, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. That's right. I don't know whether he had Steve a name. Proud. He, he did approach me a few times. And I kind of said, Steve Unbreakable. Yeah, he, he got a little kind of like talkative about things. I said, well, listen, Joe, you know, Joe, you know, I've got to go and see my girlfriend down in Tottenham. Uh, <laughs> so, right. But basically he... he it was a great introduction to production because I believe that Les Paul, in fact, is the greatest production producer. Well, he invented multi-tracking. He, he, I mean, but if you listen to the records he made, that you think that that how he made them, they were incredible. But later on, of course, you know the influence of, of his work. You know when then you not know, only Jack is producing like the Everly Brothers and things like that. But but Joe Joe believes uh, I think you might know this that that uh, he he was being his ideas were being stolen by uh, one uh, yeah. Phil uh, what was his name Phil Spector right? yeah, Phil yeah, Spector, yeah. it was a bit the other way around really but anyway there was maybe some truth in it you know that that Spector had heard it, something this but is anyway, really close to home for you because this is Holloway his studio was in Holloway wasn't right. it? I fell out of bed and went into his studio you know we went in for an audition because the bass player you know Tottenham bass player. Uh, his uh, his mum had the you know gall to to approach um, write to him or something. I got a my son's in a great band. They're called the Syndicates. You ought to see him. So he invited us in. <laughs> we locked the equipment <laughs> up the stairs and played. While she was off doing her shopping, she just popped in a, a little note <laughs> so, to Joe Meek. So he liked her. The, the Syndicates. That's so. It's such, that's so kind great. Of funny, that's pathetic, but name. also. But yeah, he liked he liked us, and, and, and you know he he did Maybelline, you know, pretty good job on that. And he and he he sped up the B side a little bit, and you know he was very strange to work with. I got to say, uh, you know, and he he sometimes fried, you know, and he'd say like, "You guys are terrible. I'm going out for an hour. When I come back, if you're not any good, you're out." You know, so we'd practice for an hour, and he'd come back. So that's all right. Okay, carry on. But you had the chops, Steve. We, you know, listening back to those early records, you're, yeah. it still was very obviously you. Yeah, I was getting so many influences, you know, particularly jazz. You know, in that early thing, I was my mind was thinking, oh yeah, 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 all this rock and roll, great. But you know, the, listen to the and I. But that was because what when you heard Wes Montgomery, you just didn't know what the hell he was doing. I mean, how can you play a guitar that good? You know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you know, as a beginner, you're kind of like stumbling with just like playing the 
tune. So yeah, I would determine to learn. Was there classical in there as well oh, yeah. for you? Because that, that comes out so much in your in your mm, yes stuff. That came in very subtly because after after sixty seven, I, I lived with my brother Phil for a while, and uh, he was in the classical and I, and, and I heard, you know, something like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, or it might have been the flute concertos actually. But anyway, I heard some Vivaldi and I thought, I like this guy. You know, I like the rhythm, so much rhythm and life and, and excitement in this, in this music. Balancing all these different musical enjoyments is, is easy. I just go with the flow, you know, I, I'll just surprise myself, think I'll listen to this or I'll do that or I hear that. So a lot of music just kind of flows around the world now, doesn't it? You don't have to be like looking yeah. for it before you hear it. Let's so let's get to tomorrow because you are. I mean, this you're one of the key. But you're one of the three bands basically. There's Pink Floyd, Soft Machine, and Tomorrow. You're a key player in that original UFO psychedelic scene, yeah. which is an amazing place to be. Yeah, it was surely it was an amazing place to be, but. You know, what was going on there? Um, we were fumbling around a bit in the studio um, making the album. It came out late, you know. But when we released My White Bicycle as a single, I mean, it went great, you know. It was edging that up the charts. And it looked like tomorrow we're going to be like, hey, you know, this is going to be something. But it kind of didn't quite, you know. But it was ever popular live. But, yeah. But Joe Boyd, you must have met Joe, who ran the UFO Club. and, and he, That's right. Was he, 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 and then he asked you to come on. I mean, was it early days? Was did you did you support Pink Floyd at one point? I'm not sure. Well, no, you were you were asked. It didn't happen, but you were asked to stand in for Sid one night. Weren't That's you? right. And it was going to be at uh, at uh, the UFO. So that was a, a, a an exciting moment for me. But then suddenly, back at the last minute, he came in the door. So uh, I don't know what it would have been. It would have been a <laughs> blindingly amazing improvisation. But I was going to mention that improvisation is, is, is everything to me. You know, I, I was so lucky that I could sit down and just noodle on a guitar. Other people saying, have you done your, did you learn to do scales? I said, no, nah, I don't bother with scales. But of course I did later on. But at first I was just noodling all the time. As soon as I could play something, I played imaginary things. You know what I mean? So that, that's been part of why I write music altogether, because without improvisation, I wouldn't have a tune. <laughs> but let's just go back into that club, because that yeah, club is really. so important. And, you know, obviously, I don't know if you know, but Guy and I play with Nick Mason. We, we do, yeah, you do the, that the, thing the Floyd stuff. So, yeah. so it's, it's dear to us as well. But <clears throat> what, was it, what was that atmosphere like? Was there a sense of, of for youth culture that, that this there was a... It was it was now your turn. It, the Beatles and the Beat groups had gone, and it was your turn. Kind of thing, but also it was like the center of the universe of musical, you know, happenings. You know, because happenings were kind of new. You know, I mean, before you just played a gig and people sat there. You know, but the happenings they they were really new. And going somewhere where it's all kind of happening, it's all that sort of like a cliche. But it, but like there's you know there's stuff on the wall. There's music going. There's I don't know. This, it was just like a jungle of of creative minds. Not all of them just music, but you know, dance and I, I really can't describe it. But it was a centre for being out of it <laughs> together and having a good time, you know. And, and, and it was all just just barely legal, so you could you could go there and sort of uh, have such a wild time. I mean, one night we were. There, I, I mean, I don't know who opened for who, but people just played there. And uh, the crazy world of Arthur Brown, um, he he set the stage on fire with it, you know, fire. <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> the place <laughs> was, and of course, this is where it's true that, that Jimi Hendrix joined tomorrow on the bass and improvised with us for about 10 minutes. Uh, no, so was he in the club? Was he in the club? Yeah, he, he was, it was that was at Blazes. Sorry, I, I must. Stick to the rules. That was the truth. Is it, that was that amazing rules? Became, <laughs> the truth. I sort of like after you know after everybody had played and you know people went to this club, and I even saw Joni Mitchell uh, singing on her own there before she was even known. So it, where was Blazes? Where was Blazes? Sorry, where was Blazes? So Blazes, yeah, this was this smart little club near Oxford Street. I'm su I'm surprised you didn't hear about it. Man, it's, it's, you're putting the ears on me now. But yeah, the speaking. Blazes, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, you no, heard no. That, no. I'm going to say yeah, I knew as, it, of as, course, as, as, as just from back as one That's of those, right. you know, like bag of nails or, yeah, or all yeah. those. Yeah, other some places. remarkable people were. And you were like, playing there, and you got up and jammed, and J and Jimmy grabbed the bass. Well, yeah, you know, I'm thinking whether it was Blazes or, or the UFO. Um, you know, I think it was the UFO. Okay, yeah. we'll have that. 
it was much yeah we'll definitely have that i'm amazed that this isn't a better document i think well, it I is am. mentioned I mean, let's face it everyone was off their head yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is mentioned in my book and i have mentioned it in uh, in a few interviews so um it might come back to me which ones and as you heard him as a guitar player oh of course point. yeah in fact you know the tomorrow we're lucky enough to be no, okay, Blazes. We were lucky enough to be the resident band in Blazes. We played there every Thursday. And Jimi Hendrix oh, came yeah. there, and he played. That was one of his first shows in the club called Blazes. If you look up his history, you will see. That it's either wow. that was the second, or it was the first show he ever did in the UK. And basically, you know, he showed up, and nobody knew what he was doing. I mean, he was just amazing. You know, this huge guy up there with a strap around the wrong way. And it all looked wrong, but it all sounded right. And actually, he came off stage and sat down with us on the table, and there was Twink and, and Junior. And, you know, the band stayed. We were always hanging out together. And he said, I hear you're the opening band or something. So we were, he was so kind. Of course, we ran into him a few times, you know, after that opening for him, like, a, you know, at um, the, the big show, the Christmas on Earth concerts. And, you know, like you said, tomorrow, you were big and tomorrow up, and it's true. We were we were really well respected, and, and uh, it was a great time to be part of that whole, you know, um, style. And you were going to maybe be the band in Blow Up. Oh, right. Isn't yes. Isn't about the guitar was made? It was actually a copy that, of yours instead of the other. Yeah, that's right. Well, we we had the gig first, and then we were ousted because, obviously, the, the, the Yardbirds had a name. And but they didn't re, they didn't get new models of of Jeff's guitar or whatever it was. Uh, they didn't get a Strat. They, the, so he had to break a one seven five cardboard copy or something like. I mean, <laughs> that's as much as I know. It does happen. Yeah, you hardly see him, but he starts breaking his guitar, and it's not his guitar. And of course, the whole thing was it was a mistake, wasn't it? Because the whole reason that scene was written because it was meant to be the hood. <laughs> it's a kind of horrible mix up. I don't know where. <laughs> no. where but while yeah. we're on the movie tip, oh, smashing no, time. I so I'd love to. That looks so great. I mean, it just looks dreadful, yes. but so fantastic. You are in on IMDb time. as being in smashing time, Steve. And having, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how we got that. You know, but the, the snarks. snarks. That's right. There was. A, the, I were, should add that to my list of ten bands I've been in. I've also been in the. No, uh, wait for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It sounds like something. It sounds like something that you'd there's see a, in private. There's a guy, eye, I think. Yeah, it? yeah, it does. Uh, because I think there's a guy that really deserves a, a, a name check, and that's um, Lord Anthony Rufus Isaacs. And uh, I think he's still around. And basically, he was a guy who had all the connections where we were playing dead parties, and you know, these very smart players get paid loads of money. And um, so basically, I think he had an in with films or something. And the next thing we knew. Uh, we were kind of, you know, part of the story. You know, the Snarks were this band that were doing it. Yeah, but there's only there's only a couple of lines. I think I, I say something like, let's have them or let's get them or something like that. There's not very much style. <laughs> Before we move away from tomorrow, there's a couple of other things, because I did hear... We, I, we, I met, is there, though? Is there? There is. <laughs> no, I'm <done. laughs> there's, there's the day before tomorrow. Anyway, uh, no, it's... Um, when you I mentioned you were recording in Abbey Road when the Beatles yes. were, were there doing Sergeant Peppers, there is this story, I'm sure it's apocryphal, that you, you needed a policeman's whistle and you went out onto the street looking for a cop. Absolutely. Combat. I mean, that's <laughs> exactly right. Um, I mean, making working with Mark Wurtz was really great fun. Uh, I mean, he was, our, he was the only... He was a, a really good producer for us because, you know, he let us do what we held we like mainly. But, you know, he had some tricks, you know, backwards stuff and he was you know he was up to speed so yeah we were doing uh you know the song my white bicycle and uh needed a whistle so we said how do we get a policeman's whistle you know and next thing somebody was outside looking for the policeman of course they were only too happy to come in for five minutes and uh you know if everything was concealed and air sprayed the guy comes in and uh, yeah, okay uh, see do it here we'll give you a cue and the uh, policeman screams and i can't hear it and he blows the whistle. Yeah. And he blew his whistle. Yeah, so that is, that is genuine amazing. police whistle. Did did um did Hapsash and the Colour Coat design a poster? F is there a tomorrow poster? Yeah, yeah. We because were because it. what a what a thing, Steve, that you have had the the Nigel Weymouth, Michael English, Hapsash design, and Roger Dean I know, in your I'm life. Like, yeah, yeah, just yeah. so lucky. And and a sport, sport, absolutely rotten because you know both are great. I mean, Roger's Roger's been wonderful all over these years. 
But uh, those guys and that whole thing with Granny Takes a Trip, you know, and how we, you know, 200 pounds shirts and things. <laughs> or maybe they weren't quite so expensive as that, but they, you know, it was worth worth having the right clothes, that was for sure. And if you had a few stars on your forehead, didn't hurt either. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I've been very lucky with with design and photographers too. You know, a guy called Mickey Slingsby was was an art photographer that uh, took a lot of pictures of me um, over my career. But other great guys, you know, Aerosmith, you know, some of the top photographers oh, yeah. filmed Yes and other bands I've been in. And a guy called Mike Russell, in fact, took some great pictures, GTR and other other things. So I've seen how photography is so important you know and i enjoy it too i take a few pictures i put them in my album series homebrew if it's a guy pushing a pram across the zebra crossing i got it you know i want that you know <laughs> it's funny though because i i don't know about you guy i mean what i one of the things i loved about those early s albums is um was the fact that it wasn't necessarily a picture apart from on the s album obviously there, yeah. there was hmm. but it, it was this fantasy world that was hmm. somehow Oh yeah, no, it was um, yeah. where you know the music was coming from. It was coming right. from those floating islands. I know. Ro it, it's just uncanny how well Rogers worked. Not only worked perfectly on Fragile, but then with the awful exceptions of when he he wasn't invited, all the other times he came up with sensational things. I mean, there's one album. I'm not going to mention what it was, but later on he did an album, and I said to him, "It's better than the music." <laughs> there was one album <laughs> that, that didn't work out so well. So he, yeah. Roger's been sustain, you know, had the sustaining power. You know, uh, 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 it's really amazing how. Well, I think it's got the most. It's probably the most symbiotic relationship of of kind of artists. Yeah. Uh, you is basically yes, and Roger Dean, yes. Pink Floyd, and Hypnosis yeah. are the two yeah. most. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Even yeah. though, even though, I mean, every band jump was jumping on the bandwagon after that, were yes. they? I mean, you know, to, you know, from Giant to, I mean, like. You know, people were all try wanted Roger Dean to make yes. those records. Somehow, they all felt like a bit of a rip off because it was yes, it belonged to yes. Yeah. Well, it did, but look at the shot I had when he did Asia, because Asia too had a, a oh, the dragon. Yeah, the yeah. dragon. They had the, the the logo with this. You see, Roger was up to his tricks again, and he he cast the magic a little bit on on Asia for a while, and and some of that Asia stuff is has lasted many many years. You know. And so he did that. And some Bruce Wakeman. <laughs> he happened to do a lot of bands that I was in. He's done some solo albums of mine as well, including Turbulence. Because they, I mean, while we're on him, we'll stay on him. Because I mean, mm -hmm. even though we're not talking about you in Yes yet, but it, it it's, it's that logo, that bubble writing of Yes, mm -hmm. all joining up. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about you, guy, but I mean. You're, couple of years younger than me but every kid in my class every bloke in my class oh, oh no could... no i did that on an exercise book <laughs> did it on, yeah you knew how to and of do course that. it was the same because of course he did the virgin logo didn't he yes which yes. is the same sort of thing that original virgin yeah logo. yeah he did quite a few <laughs> how were you introduced to him um we were oh it's it's kind of funny story we'd done the yes album blah 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 we were being managed by a guy. And he, at the time, had a job at Hemda, which became, you know, big. this was in, like, early, very early 70s. So he was working at Hemda. Somehow, it's a fantastic uh, crossroads, and here's Yes sitting in this Mayfair office, you know, and, and it's all all kind of grappling to get food on the table and with somebody in a Mayfair office with these guys. They're also doing so well, great. And then suddenly, um, through the management, uh, or Hemdale, you know, we put the feelers out and this guy called Roger Dean comes in and shows us some stuff and, and we were instantly, you know, taken to it. And uh, so he went off and designed the Fragile Sleeve based on that. And Because if you put your guitar and John Anderson's lyrics into an AI machine, it would have come up with Roger Dean's front <laughs> covers, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but is it, this sounds like, is there a thing that, that like, mm. luckily he was, you were the guys that he came to see? Mm. He could have gone to see someone else yes. and then, you know, yes. everyone's story would be different. You see, some people wanted, and I think this is what hypnosis did for Floyd, they'd come along with like six pictures and you pick one, you know, one of them. But what Roger did was try and get a feel for the album and then go away and do one, you know. So 
um, it was very much, you know, it felt like it was a very personalised process. And that's true of all the albums. I mean, particularly, you know, I'm just, not particularly anything. It's true of all the albums. Uh, Tales from Tropical Africa Oceans, you know, that's another exceptional thing. But I'll give Roger every bit of credit. He, he, he generally comes up with a concept. It's brilliant that you had someone with a very sort of strong visual identity to present to you because of you had all these competing, perhaps very strong personalities in the band. Certainly, we had a an unusual. I think you know you needed a sort of special ear to like. Yes, you know, it was <laughs> obvious because we we didn't do single. You know, we weren't getting played like the regular regular bands. We we were carving a, a much more progressive rock approach to things, which was everything's a catalog piece and we're going to make more records and we're going to do more tours so we're just going to keep revolving and and yes it's always was and always will be fundamentally a, a fairly hard working band you know we we haven't got to the point or nor do we really want to where you know everybody says uh we're kind of loaded let's call it this <laughs> We're, we're kind of like we've got commitments and, and they're partly to carry on the music that, uh, you know, the ones that we've lost started as well hmm. and live up, you know, and live up to to the to the idea of what Yes Music is, we hope. You, you mentioned prog rock um, and not having no singles. There must have been something that pushed that, that created that genre before Yes. And I know that one of the bands that often gets cited is is the nice with Keith Emerson. You you but actually you auditioned for sorry, yes. Yeah, you, you auditioned, sorry. didn't you? Here's another quick story. Yeah, that's right. I did. I I would have loved to have done that. I mean, I got the job. But the next day I had, you know, palpitations on what the consequences for the people I was working with were gonna be if I quit, you know, and I've never put Who were you with at that point? I was with this group, Bodas, you know, and... Uh, oh, but which, we, which came after uh, we were tomorrow, not, yeah, yeah, we were not getting very far. With an album that never came out, right? Your, well, your album, but right. you, you released the album yourself. That's right. Ten years later, I, I released it. But, but basically, um, that, was, that was a bit of a nightmare to come out of that and um, go into, uh, uh, you know, the next phase, um, which was to be something memorable. <laughs> so how Oh, hang on, we're talking about, we so sorry, while we're back there, because, yeah, you're playing with Ronnie Wood. That's right. And Ainsley Dunbar. Well, yeah, Keith West Keith got West. some solo tracks together. I mean, you yeah. know, it was a lo- great time. There was a lot of roaming and gloaming going on with... So I'm saying, you were everywhere, man. You were <laughs> Just casually, yeah. I mean, also, I was quite a lot of EMI studios doing sessions, you know, for... <laughs> For the rate, but but basically that was also fun because Mark took me. Mark works took me under his wing. Not mm-hmm. only, well, I suppose he took me under his wing, and then he produced tomorrow because you know we got on so well, and he thought you know he'd like to produce tomorrow. I, I think we strayed off the question though. Did we left a, a question unanswered there? Is any? Well, it was the nice. Oh, yeah. I think the nice was. So the, I, was, yeah. I would have loved to have done that, and I got the job successfully. As I say, I got palpitations about you know letting a whole load of people down and i wouldn't recommend that that's not a a very career conscious decision was that was that before five bridges or after um i can't well it was anything after dave lifts not being there would be when right okay okay so oh right because he went off with uh, hmm. to work with uh, king crimson right did actually or whether he was in a clear state of mind to do anything because i thought the reason i was coming in was that david list had slightly lost it and that you know he wasn't uh, working so well with with the guy i don't know what the story is. i can't remember it's a long time ago but um yeah there's lots of those little moments when you think oh that could have gone this way well i love playing with mm-hmm. keith i must say but there were other reasons too a little bit of concern about the way he was set up with a guy, you know, walked in the pub and pulled out money. And I'd never seen that before, really. There, there was a sort of lack of discretion, I feel, business discretion, you know. But anyway, I was I was in a different camp, if you like. I, I wasn't in the camps, you know, like... I, it could, it, it, yeah, it could have been Emerson, Howe and Palmer that's right, at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the roll, on the roll. Goodness, yeah. So were you aware of the of Yes as a band before you ended up being... Um, auditioning just marginally yeah i mean i'd heard this but i'd heard about the band and i heard they were very good so i didn't hear hadn't heard the music and uh but i'd heard about the reputation so when the guys you know when chris gordon i went and played 
with the guys in Barnes. It was just amazing. I mean, I walked in, plugged in. They said, yeah, well, we'll do this song. It's got G and it goes to A or something or the other. We messed around with some songs. And um, I thought they were great. You know, I really thought, Damn, this is really good. I better not. So who's in the room? Who's, who's well, in the room? Bill Bruce was on oh, drums. Chris Bill, is on, yeah. on, on bass, and John sitting there with a the microphone, and Tony Kay's on on Hammond, yeah. and where he's always comfortable and he plays like he plays it great. You know, he's a great player. So basically, that band was was really uh, exciting just to come in because they had and, their own psychedelic band previous to that, which I think has still got the best name in psychedelia, which is Mabel Greer's Toy Shop. <laughs> somebody did refer to that as possibly the tweest psychedelic yeah. group name yeah. Yeah. but it is uh yeah that's right um that's where chris and uh, peter banks had been i believe together and uh yeah it was, but it was chris but, was chris the driving force when you when you turned up that day was well i mean to me i i related more to, to john when i met them both you know, and John and I, I think I even went back to John's flat after this in, in Queensgate or something. He lived there with his with his wife. And we nice. talked about, I think there was the place where we talked before that. So I really only talked to John about joining the band, if you like. But at, at, at the rehearsal, it was obviously interactive. And, you know, the, 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 they felt I was, uh, I was pretty good. And uh, you I, changed I their well, style, didn't you, really? They weren't. Those first two albums don't sound like the Yes we now know on the Yes album mm -hmm. and once you joined. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a way, um, I've only, I, I don't think I've thought this before, but I would look back, when I've looked back with you kind of thing, like I think there's a lot more order. In other words, there's not overflowing amounts of something that kind of, some of the uh, arranging uh, or some of the mixing, you know, on time in a word, left it a little bit like it was a bit of a struggle. There was always this struggle going on in the sound. I think with Eddie Offord stepping up to the plate and co-producing that the Yes album with us, gave us all the chance to put input, but also we had a guy who was pretty clever at doing what he was doing, you know, and, and possibly a bit of a, uh, ahead of his time. So that all helped tremendously. But who was guiding the way, do you think, out there as far as being able to make songs that were in multiple timings, key signatures that that were longer than a normal single. It was was it was it Fripp? Was it King Crimson? What, who gave you the validation, the license to do well, that? There was a very good balance between John, who didn't really play a lot of chords, didn't really have a, a big technique, but he could strum away and, and get some melody going. But what he was also very very good at encouraging and allowing and it was the instinct of the band that everybody put stuff in you know not so much like another song but like if you had something you'd have to decide how you're going to play that and make it sound great you know so it wasn't just a question of like, going to play the roots and, and bill's going to stay in four four that was out you know that wasn't allowed so n nobody could float or just just drift along only for a while you know while you're finding your parts and of course, some of the best parts came from Chris, but they took a long time. So everybody had plenty of time to get your parts together while Chris was developing, you know, how to finesse his part. Or he'd overdub it or overdub some of it after we recorded it. But all that rehearsing was good. You know, we'd record things. It always sounded like, fortunately, 100% better when we, when we, like, worked on it in the studio you know we take it in and say that sounds horrible well, you, wouldn't you uh, some of it you, you you would literally assemble like sweets wouldn't you wouldn't it just be like one piece at a time oh, well that we did record like that but usually yeah. we had to go in with a demo that that had most of the song maybe not all of it but most of the song and it ran through even if it was edited but yeah when we got in there we usually found because of the size of the tracks of course we 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 we'd only record one section if we were lucky a day, you know, and that section might be three minutes or it might be five minutes or it might be two minutes. So it just depends how we were going to do it. And as we went through the Yes album, I mean, it was really is interesting because when we got to uh, uh, your move, I've seen a lot of good people, you know, somewhere we said, well, mm -hmm. you know, don't let's play this; it's not going to work. So we we created the loop, you know, the go. Boop, 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 that's all it is. Boop, boop, kept going. Boop, boop. I think I had a note on it. Chris had a knee as well. Boop, boop. So basically, there it was. And I went out and 
you know, I, we've agreed how how many of what we'd have because obviously you couldn't edit this later, you know, like you do today. Oh, we'll have an extra verse. Oh, great, throw it in. No, mm-hmm. this had to be like, you had to play it and every verse was was different. So I'd go out there and I demoed the whole song, if you like. Well, not demo, but I mastered the Portuguese guitar all the way through it and that was the structure. Agreed, you know, well, I didn't do it on my own, but it was all agreed. We'd have three of these, two of them, and half a dozen of them, you know. And then I had the chance to, you know, do any fiddly bits I'd do it. And then maybe I'd track it. And then that would quit, you know, then we'd add stuff. And, and it was, so it was lovely that, yes, even in that early stage, we're actually taking on a production, nothing to do with playing. It had all to do with prepared musical ideas going into mm-hmm. effect to create space and quality of sound, you know, where that Portuguese guitar is properly recorded. You know, nobody's hammering away in the background with the cymbal. You know, yeah, yeah. You know everything was separate. Every, and it, the roundabout and uh, fragile really epitomizes that even more. When you got to that album, I mean, it's so tight, you know, oh, for, for its time. You know, Chris and, and Bill, you know, on roundabout and the, 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 the acoustic guitars I put on, the, the harmonics. I mean, that 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 was a really good way to start it. You know, we didn't have any grunge. We didn't have anything to take out. We didn't have any mistakes, you know, that anybody did. It was all, I think that's what it was. It was pre- preparation and structure and invention mm-hmm. because we never said, let's do it better. You weren't overdubbing, were you? You were doing a guitar solo uh, on no, your own. I was overdubbing was, was the big, we're, we're, I mean, I got some nice rhythm guitars at times, which you'll hear. Like maybe Jana, ding, 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 that's when the original guitar, but all the other verses and all the other stuff were, were carefully worked out, uh, you know, afterwards with, with the same guitars, you know, same amp. Right, right. And, uh, and things like that, but basically, but you, you, have, you've always from from very early on, you were very, very involved and c- kind of interested in the actual recording process of the guitar, weren't you? Yeah, that's right. I always so, felt that you know Kenny Kenny Burrell was a great example of jazz guitarist who I believe he always saw his guitar through, and I used to recommend this: don't just play and walk away, go out and have a beer. You know, watch how that guitar, where's the position? What's the EQ? Mm. What's the reverb? <laughs> Can we put some delays on it? You know, what do you want to do with that? Because you just recorded it. Don't leave it to somebody else who maybe thinks, oh, you know, thinks. That's right. Guitars for life, not just for Christmas, right? That's <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I like that craftsmanship. And it's now, you know, I'm doing more production than I've ever done. But I've, you know, I've produced my own uh, solo albums. But I've been part of the team that's produced yes from day one you know but mm-hmm. not, i think you know, the, you know what i what i'm get what i get talking to you is actually you know we all think about prog rock coming from i just as i said earlier from bands like keith emerson and the nice but actually psychedelia was so important wasn't it i mean those early yes. pink, pink floyd albums you know with interstellar mm-hmm. overdrive and source full of secrets mm-hmm. what they well, were doing yeah, gary you're saying it was actually i'm sorry this just to reiterate your point you carry on afterwards it's just that actually that long form free for sort of prog structure comes from those pink floyd jams yeah. at the ufo club yeah. i would have thought yeah well, i mean no i said earlier impro is everything and i mean you know i would I would, uh, I'm getting the memories of how important, you know, like a, a good guitar break is to me. You know, we do Siberian Couture and it's a great song. You know, it's complex. It's got lots of changing rhythm. There's lots of textures and sound. And then I go, da, 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 da. And I start jamming, you know, and, and that's okay. Leave me with, leave me with this for a few rounds, guys. <laughs> great. And, Fantastic. You know, I like cooking up something on the guitar and that that's a guitar break, you know, and, we had uh, Rick Wakeman on the show as well, and obviously, what a huge personality to come in! But you already knew Rick, didn't you? Didn't you do some sessions? Didn't you do Lou Reed with him before? No, that was done up when we were doing Topographic Ocean. Oh, so, so. Well, sorry. But so, but what a personality to come in! I mean, very different from Tony Kay and all the Moog stuff. Did you feel that enhanced what you did, or was there? Were you hmm. sort of, you know? trying to find your own space now Rick had come in no it was the development of, of, with Tony it was a shame Tony left but but he didn't really want to do multi keyboards you know and, and he stuck to his guns in doing that and uh, I, I, I love him much but basically we were definitely looking for anybody who could who could play multi keyboards yes needed that you know we needed the, the orchestral side and we needed all the keyboards that came with you know organ piano electric piano you know, whatever have you, harpsichord, you know. So we needed that, but also, you know, we needed somebody who was thinking, you know, about the about the future and the development, mini Moog, 
you know, the Mellotron and all the other gadgety sort of keyboards that came out in the second half of the 70s were really exciting. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've got more involved in, in keyboards myself recently. And basically, it's a wonderful tool. You know, it's a wonderful, wonderful way of, of making music. Um, so, yeah, right then we, we did need somebody who had the precision and the, the uh, well, wanted to, you know, this. I mean, yes, it's a, a thing like, you know, do you want to break? You know, do you want to get in here and make it better? And that was the approach we had, you know, when Alan joined and when and when Rick joined. And then Patrick Moraz, who was also uh, mm -hmm. pretty amazing, what he contributed. Um, and then Rick came back and then, then Jeff Downs came in. So, I mean, the keyboard position is is really a, a big demand. You know, it's a very high demand job. How was it going into the 80s, though, uh, Steve? But, right. Having Trevor Horn now as the lead singer in, for, for the drama album. Did, did you feel that, actually, were you nervous about becoming more commercial? Obviously, you become more commercial with Asia. Christ, I mean, you had the biggest selling album in, in America in 1980, yeah. whatever it was. But the, the drama thing was just amazing. I mean, it was totally amazing. I loved all of that. Because what happened was... Chris Allen and I were rehearsing after the tomato, you know, period had ended and uh, we kept not having anybody else in the room. So we suddenly realised... But John has know, left, right? Well, no, he hadn't officially or maybe even Rick hadn't left, but they weren't there. And in reality, you know, for a few weeks, you start to realise they're not here and we'll just get on with this. So we started writing Tempest Fugit and this other stuff. And then Chris says to me, what do you think about Video Kill the Radio? So I said, yeah, but like, wow. He said, but that band got a great album. So I listened to it. In fact, I listened to it on quad electrostatic speakers. And I listened to this and I'm going, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is this band. And I went to Chris. I said, you're totally right. I mean, these guys would be amazing, you know, and they came and they joined. And we did drama. And Machine Messiah is is now one of the live, most exciting tracks with, that we can play. It's really seriously exciting and electrifying. And uh, I don't really know why, but we love that album. We've done it in, uh, as an album series as well. So, yeah, the drama was was really something. Um, it brought Trevor and I much, much closer, you know, and... You know, of course, he loved Chris dearly and, and admired Chris for all his work because, you know, Trevor's a bass player. Yeah. And basically, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, but Trevor's skills, you know, as a songwriter were starting to really shine, you know, and, uh, you know, they'd already proven, you know, done the Buggles album. You know, The Age of Plastic mm -hmm. is, is not a pop album, you know. I mean, that's a pop song. And a bit like, you know, Atlantic editing Roundabout and making it a chart success to help, yes, go forwards with Fragile. You know, we weren't thinking like that. You know, that's what the Buggles had. They had pop success. But there again, yes, yes, didn't want that. We weren't going to do that. <laughs> we weren't going to go on stage and play video kill the radio star because Trevor and Jeff knew that wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's quite. But then, the, and then there's a lovely repaying of the compliment when um, um, Trevor gets you in to play on the Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Well, that's right. Uh, I, I, I'm really, you know, happy to say, you know, Trevor and I stayed in touch, and basically, I, I popped in on a lot of things, you know, that, that happened, giving it a try, you know, and been part of things that, uh, you know, I, I've learned more about because of it, you know. And how did you feel when? you weren't there anymore and Trevor comes in and produces what becomes one of the biggest songs that yes ever made. Did you feel, I mean, listen, you're, you've got nothing to complain about because you've joined Asia, right? right? And Asia are you, huge. You, you're not sitting in your bed, sit with your press cuttings right. for company. I mean, you're fine. <laughs> I mean, utterly huge. I mean, with, with yeah, commercial yeah. hits, with, you know, and then you've got, you've got, it's, it's amazing, isn't it guy? When you think about it, you've got, you've got the guy from yes, the guy from e ELP, the guy mm. from King Crimson, they get together and make the most commercial rock album you yeah, could imagine. Yeah. I think all of us wanted a big change. I mean, because, you know, I've had 10 years. In fact, there was a moment where, I won't tell you the whole story, but, but Trevor and, and Chris and Alan had just left my house and Jeff and I were sitting there were going, um, seems like we haven't got any other guys in the back. We're the only guys left. And I said to Tre uh, Jeff right then and there, I said, look, everything's been so much for 10 years. I, I don't want to attempt to re-slot another yes. So... And then, I, I, you know, I just left that. I don't leave that. And before long, I met John Wetton and then Carl. And then I suggested Jeff Downs joined 
you know, us. And, and that's what made Asia a complete unit because we had the, you know, thumping keyboards and everything else happening. Thumping drums. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what's, what's Yes about to do now, Steve? Well, what we're about to do is um, we're uh, going to be rehearsing for the European, UK, Japanese tour that goes from uh, the end of April. It trickles along through May. We come to the UK in, in the, towards the end of May. We play the Albert Hall. I think it's on the 3rd of June, I think it is. Wow. And Yeah. We're, think, go, think, we're well, going in just a little bit after you. Until I've quoted myself. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in after you. 4th of June. I hope you're not on the 4th, mate, because <laughs> you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're there too. Great. Well, we're there on the Tuesday the 4th of June. And uh, we that's where we end that part of the show. Then we go to Japan in September. Uh, oh, lucky you. Lucky you. Yeah, Japan's a nice country to play. And you don't get tired touring, Steve? It's, it's all, You like the energy still? Well, I wouldn't say it's not tiring. No, I'll never say it's not tiring. It is tiring. But, um, yeah, I've still got the energy for it. Um, and it, I've, I've enjoyed, in some way, the way it's shifted from... You know, 2019, we were in a role. In fact, we were in such a role in 2019, we had half the year off because we'd worked for half the year. And then we said, can't do any more. I mean, we just worked. What do we need to do? Nothing. Let's have it off. But then we didn't know what was in store. Um, a couple of years off from touring meant we could just record, you know, really great. I love to make records and we make the quest and just recently Mirror to the Sky. Mirror to the Sky, which, got us up, which I love, which Wait, is great. Thanks. So, again, Roger Dean, Forte, everything's yeah. happening. So this tour leg is going to be, it's called something like the Tales of Yes tour. And that's because we're just looping around from 73 being a bit of an anniversary with Topographic Ocean. So we're not playing all of Topographic Oceans, but we play something about it, if you put it, uh, put it mildly. I love so, Topographic Oceans. I got it for Christmas, right? In fact, yeah. I think I got Topographic Oceans for one Christmas. I think I got Relayer for the next Christmas. <laughs> I remember Topographic Oceans, I put it on in the morning at Christmas while we're doing, mum's preparing the dinner and everything. <laughs> I think I got a side four and mum said, could you take that off? It's ruining our Christmas. Side three must have been... Must I have think been it, a real, it's right, the war or something that was... Yeah, side yeah. three, yeah. Amazing, yeah. And side two was the great unplayed. We're playing some of side two. We're, the side two was the great unplayed side because for so long we, we didn't play that. And uh, so, yeah, we like to revisit that. But we put a set list together... We, you know, we kick it around. It's got songs we like on it. And uh, that's what it's called, The Tales of Yes Tour. <laughs> Fabulous. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm so, and Steve, I've, there's one thing I've got to sh I really want to share with you, which is that I had an amazing box tick last year, which is that I got asked to play at the John Wetton Tribute. And I played uh, with, it was Phil Manzanero who put the band together and asked me to play with him and Chris Difford. And on drums... Bill Bruford, who had, who was, you know, who'd be, who's been retired. It was the first thing he played for years, having been in retirement. It was fantastic. But what was funny was we played, um, we played "Let's Stick Together," which is one of John Wetton's greatest bass lines, even though it's the simplest thing in the world. And it was quite funny because it's such a simple, straight-ahead thing. And uh, and I wrote it with this, all the people who are playing that night. In fact, Chris Difford said at the end of the song, "That's the only four-four you're going to hear all night." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was Bill Bruford. He, he's not yeah, been around Bill Bill too. And it was great. I've, I've got it. It was just such a thrill to play with him. Yeah, I wanted to so. be there. I, I sent a video for that, and I dearly love John. And even though for many years, you know, we didn't speak because you know th there was so much distance between us, you know. Mm -hmm. But we really, from 2006 onwards, we we just warmed to each other in a way that was really remarkable. And love John so so Talking much. Of, sorry, Steve. I, I wanted. So I, to ask yeah. you if you still, if you ever speak to John Anderson still, because obviously you have a different singer for Yes now, and uh, he's been there a long time. But I wondered if there, there was ever, a, you know, connection between you two. We're we're still in touch, and that's all I'll say. That's yeah. good. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, Brilliant. he's a wonderful guy. Um, but yeah, as, as we were saying, that that it's amazing that Bill uh, played there, and um, my lips are sealed. But yeah, it's amazing what Bill did because he did stop playing for, for over yeah, long, years. Yeah, long time. And then yeah. he spent two years like relearning. So, you know, he's a formidable force and, and oh. uh, 
As Love I said it. to him recently, there's only one guy that plays like Phil. <laughs> That's Phil. He's had a remarkable career, but, you know, he just decided enough was enough and he's got another kind of way of doing it now, which I'm really pleased. You, you don't think he got upset when I asked if he speaks to John Anderson still, do you? He was so upset. Really? Does he hate, he so does he hate That's me? Why the, that's why we stopped. Oh, you know, no. We've actually had to pad this out, listeners. He, we actually you only had three minutes. We started really well, and then you had to say that. I know. I didn't know whether I said the wrong thing or not. But, you know, you wonder, no, don't you? You wonder, don't no, you? But, no, but you're quite good at that, Gary. You're quite good at... Because uh, everyone wants to know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like you're the... Unfortunately, that's you're well, the guy. Well, having been in there. a band, an estranged band myself. I, 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 well, exactly. I mean, was it uh, okay? Let, so let's turn this around. How do you feel when people come up and ask you that? I, th- I think it's an you're honest just, question. Just nothing. It's an, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't ask him is if he supports Arsenal or Tottenham. I couldn't believe that little floating he's doing between Highbury and uh, between Holloway Road and Tottenham. But there you go. Um, I, I thought he. Was, I thought it was great to have on and and. You know, such a a man who is so keen about the music still. Yeah, yeah. You want a wee, don't you? I'm dying you, for a you wee. You need a wee. See, that's the trouble with long podcasts when you're old. <laughs> ah, maybe our listeners, but well, our, our listeners can have a wee while they're listening, can't they? You can't have a wee while you're recording, or are you? That's just is there it. some sort of that's commode you're sitting on? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'll I'll I'll. We'll see you all next week. You'll hear us next week. We'll have someone brilliant on, hopefully. I think we, I know we have. We'll have someone brilliant on. Oh, yeah, on. no, no, it's a good one next yeah. week. Well, it's always good. It's always good, no, isn't it? Until then, it's good night from me. It's good night from all of us. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions for Warner Music Group UK.